Welcome back, everyone. Now to introduce Elisa Adami. Elisa Adami recently completed her PhD at the Royal College of Art in London. Her dissertation focused on radical historiographical practices in the work of Lebanese artists of the post-war generation. She teaches at the Royal College of Art and Kingston University, and she is the editorial assistant of the book series Research Practice, published by Sternberg Press. Elisa's writings have appeared in academic publications such as the Journal of Visual Culture and Third Text, and she is a regular contributor to Art Monthly. She's also co-founder and co-director of Nemescape, an online publishing platform and network dedicated to contemporary art practices, exploring issues of memory, history and the archival impulse. Elisa's presentation is called Decolonial Dovetailing, Potential Encounters and Archival Elisions in Thorold Dickinson's Archive. Thank you very much, Suzanne, for, for the introduction. And uh, I want to, thanks, uh, to thank everyone at the Institute for organizing uh, this symposium today and also uh, for like, supporting us throughout the process of, of the research. And I want also to thank all the uh, archivists and, and librarians whose help has been really invaluable. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to share my, my screen now so you can um, see my uh, presentation. Um, Okay. Um, perfect. Okay, so as, as Susan said, my uh, presentation is titled Decolonial Dovetailing, Potential Encounters and Archival Elisions in Thorold Dickinson's Archive. Uh, and I've conducted research in the archive of Thorold Dickinson, uh, who was a British filmmaker and the archivist house at the Archive and Special Collection Center at LCC. Uh, and uh, I, I focus in particular on a, a micro event, uh, which was a screening that Dickinson organized in uh, 1937. Uh, and I will uh, be uh, reading a, a paper that I'm uh, writing uh, now. In December 1937, at the London Film Society, Thorold Dickinson and Ivor Montagu presented a programme that dovetailed alternate trials from Italian and Russian propaganda films, showing the fascist invasion of Abyssinia, as Ethiopia was then called. The Path of the Heroes, the bombastic official account commissioned by the fascist regime, was just opposed with Abyssinia, a Soviet counter-propaganda film documenting the war from the opposite side. The crass glorification of Italian military and technological prowess was placed side by side with its murderous consequences on the ground. The use of poison gas, atrocities and mass murder that were conveniently removed in the sanitized fascist version. The horror undercut the pomp. Shot, counter shot. The programme was titled Record of War. Although the accompanying notes shed away from any compromising political reference, its intention was clear. Fascinated by the aesthetic and political principle of montage, Dickinson applied a specialised version of cinematic montage to the reels of two documentary films. In doing so, the propaganda of Mussolini's regime was turned against itself and the brutality of Italian imperialist aggression was put on display. The verb to dovetail denotes the act of skillfully fitting together two different pieces to form a whole. As every carpenter knows, a dovetail joint consists of two interlocking pieces of wood, a flaring tenon and a mortise, which when fitted together, resist being pulled apart in all directions except one. History, is also comprised of a series of interlocking joints. This act of joining and the historical edifice that it serves to build is neither stable nor settled, but consists of an endless and multidirectional process of deconstruction and reconstruction. Yet so many pieces and fragments of the past remain occluded by or missing from the archive, which endeavors to construct its image of history out of partial and hegemonic narratives. A record is always 
missing, misplaced, mislabeled, redacted, embargoed, classified, lost, damaged, segregated. History breaks down into specialisms, the connection between adjacent events are severed in the separate cataloging. In the Thorold Dickinson's collection at the UAL Harkhaven Special Collections Center, I look for traces of a micro event and its potential political links with the individuals and communities involved in the Pan African movement and anti colonial struggle during the same period. I'm in an archive of presence, 30 grade boxes, and approximately 3,000 books and periodicals are, ar are arranged on 33 shelves. The boxes contain scripts screenplays and treatments, notes, press cuttings, reports, letters, film programs, teaching notes and conference papers. This is an archive about British film history and British film studies. It's unlikely I'll find here anything related to the history of Pan-Africanism or anti-colonial resistance movements, but I search nonetheless. I'm looking for traces of lives and ideas which are archived elsewhere in the archives of radical self-funded organizations or in the classified shelves of state surveillance apparatuses. Sometimes they are not archived at all. And yet the history and legacy of empire seeps through and stains many of these documents. It is discernible in the choice of shooting locations, the subject matter of films, realized or unrealized, and commissioning bodies. What if I was to dovetail these documents with the words and deeds of Pan-African and anti-colonial intellectuals? What new meanings would this unforeseen proximity between Dickinson and his contemporaries generate? What would it tell us about the still distorted and disavowed legacy of the British Empire? This act of dovetailing does not intend to restore a unity that never was, but to bring together disparate and contrasting experiences and memories in jarring just opposition. This critical historical montage method draws on Edward Said's notion of contrapuntual reading. In Culture and Imperialism, Said invites us to look back at the cultural archive of empire, not univocally as a symphonic harmony, but contrapuntually as an atonal ensemble of historical processes and experiences connected by colonial violence. A contrapuntual approach to history, for instance, must take account of how a certain lifestyle in 19th century Europe was made possible by overseas colonial exploitation, as well as the way in which dominant narratives were to forcibly exclude and repress particular histories and experiences. Following Said, my research attempts to trace the networks of intertwined and overlapping cultural and political events, as well as what these connections may tell us about the enduring historical legacies of empire and colonialism. File one, Pan-African voices, potential encounters and archival allusions. About the 1937 screening, Dickinson would later recall, our fashionable Sunday audience with their broad brims and capes and capacity for chatter drifted out into Regent Street in dead hold silence. What was that uneasy silence made of? Were they shocked by the brutal violence they saw? Were they ashamed by the British government's complicit inaction? Were they thinking of the crimes that had been and continued to be committed by the British colonial empire too? And were there any Ethiopian, African, Caribbean spectators among this fashionable Sunday crowd? Did any member of the International African Friends of Ethiopia, for instance, attend the event? For those who knew on their skin the wickedness of colonialism, the pain would have not been something easy to dispel in the murk of a December evening. Walking down a London street in May 1935, the young student Francis Krumer was feeling dispirited and pondering returning home rather than continuing his onward journey to study in the United States, when he heard an excited newspaper boy shouting something unintelligible. As the boy grabbed a bundle of the latest editions, Nkrumah caught sight of the headline on a placard, Mussolini invades Ethiopia. He would note famously in his autobiography that this shocking piece of news was all that he needed to overcome his malaise. At that moment, it was almost as if the whole 
and declare war on me personally. For the next few minutes, I could do nothing but glare at each impassive face, wondering if those people could possibly realize the wickedness of colonialism. The Italian invasion of Ethiopia was arguably the single event in the period that most powerfully inflamed the imagination of black people and colonized subjects around the world, serving as the rallying call for an emergent anti-colonial movement. In the 30s, Ethiopia was the only sovereign uh, black state to be recognized as a member of the League of Nations. Liberia, the other notionally independent black nation, had become an American protectorate and mortgaged to the Firestone Rubber Company, thanks to the machinations of Yankee dollar diplomacy, as George Padmore eloquently put it. An attack on the very principle of black sovereignty at a time when the great majority of Africans and people of African descent lived in colonial domination or racial segregation. The reverberations of the Italian aggression were felt across continents, reaching as far as China. The global and largely spontaneous character of the black response, Cedric Robinson explained, was due to the symbolic value of Ethiopia, a country confluent with the notion of Africa in the mind of diasporic communities. The mobilization spread like wildfire. In the US, as the crisis emerged from late 1934, black led aid organizations proliferated. Elsewhere, a hundred Liberian, Ovambo and Caro dock workers in Southwest Africa refused to work on Italian ships. In Kenya, the Kikuyu Central Association enlisted volunteers for the campaign in Ethiopia. Egyptian doctors reported to Addis Ababa. And hundreds of West Indians from British Guiana, Cuba and Trinidad the Bahamas requested permission from their colonial authorities to enlist in the armies of Ethiopia. In London, African and West Indian intellectuals, workers and students, despite reservations about the emperor's rule and his racial misconceptions, organized public demonstrations in order to pressure the British government into support of Ethiopia. In this constellation of notes of anti-colonial insurgency, London was, as per Minka Makalani's effective characterization, a unique incubator for radical black internationalist discourse. This coalesced particularly around the International African Friends of Abyssinia, promptly renamed to African Friends, International African Friends of Ethiopia, an organization formed in London in July 1935 by Cela James, Emmy Harshwood Gavi, Chris Braithwaite, uh, Jomo Kenyatta, George Padmore, and others to support Ethiopia's struggle to maintain its independence. After the defeat of the Ethiopians with the fall of the capital city Addis Ababa in May 1936, the organization would eventually change its name to the International African Service Bureau and increasingly shift its attention from Italy's invasion of Ethiopia to the deplorable conditions in the British colonies throughout West Africa. Dickinson's record of war was screened at the New Gallery Cinema on 121-25. Regent Street, house of a London Film Society. Just down the road, at 50 Carnaby Street, was the Florence Mills Social Parlour, a nightclub and a restaurant run by Hamia Shburgavi and her husband, singer-comedian Sam Manning, that served as an official headquarters of the International African Friends of Ethiopia. Figures whose lives the archive remembers as separate may well have brushed shoulders in Regent Street on a busy Sunday evening. The geographic proximity in the urban fabric of a colonial metropole stands in stark contrast with their archival segregation. I ask again, was any member of the International African Friends of Ethiopia by then International African Service Bureau in attendance at the screening of Record of War? As I continue to speculate about potential encounters, I find a newspaper cutout announcing the screening of two films, a fascist propaganda film paired with a film shot by Russian operators at the Phoenix Theatre in Charing Cross Road on Tuesday, 15 February 1938, around two months after Dickinson's programme was shown. Organised by British suffragette Sylvia Pankas, editor of the campaigning newspaper New Times and Ethiopia News, 
the screening was preceded by an address of the Abyssinian emperor, Halie Salassie, who had fled into exile in England after the Italian victory. Originally, Pankas had planned to include the Path of Heroes in the program, a telling detail that seems to confirm that she had seen Record of War and probably took from there the idea of repeating the juxtaposition of films without the technical refinement of Dickinson's dovetailing method. However, Istituto Luce, the Italian State Film Corporation, complain about the unauthorized interpolation of the path of heroes in the film society screening and suppress its use for future unofficial presentations. Henry K. Miller, a film scholar who in 2007 organized the reenactment of Dickinson's 1937 program, speculated about potential encounters between the British director and Pan-African intellectuals and activists too. It is unclear, he writes, what uh, C.L.R. James and his Pan-Africanist uh, confederates in the International African Service Bureau saw so record of war, adding is as if to substantiate the hypothesis that the International African Service Bureau was in contact with Panka's organization and James was an admirer of the Russian films in which the society specialized. I realized that my obsession to discover traces of encounters that may have not even happened may lead nowhere. Even if I was to find evidence that an encounter took place, what would that prove? Perhaps a more fruitful approach would be to take the radical critiques of colonialism that were elaborated by members of the International African Service Bureau and dovetail them with Dickinson's own rather naive and apologetic representation of the British Empire. What the Pan-African intellectuals associated with the organization brought to the table, as Priyam Vara Gopal explains, was an analysis which insisted on considering the relationship between fascism and colonialism in a global frame, rather than conveniently depicting them as opposed geopolitical forces. George Padmore, in particular, coined the term colonial fascism to describe those authoritarian, racist and violent practices of governance that were applied in colonial contexts by the putatively democratic nations. The implication was that, as Robin Kelly has observed, fascism was not some aberration from the march of progress, an unexpected right-wing turn, but a blood relative of European cap capitalism and imperialism. I stop and listen to the voices of the Pan-African intellectuals and let their lucid analysis and critiques of empire and colonialism refract and reverberate across the sealed surface of Dickinson's archive. British imperialism will not fight Italy either for Abyssinia or for collective security. It will fight for British imperialist interests and nothing else. But imperialism remains imperialism. An African in Eritrea is no worse off uh, under Italian fascism than an African in Congo under democratic Belgium or a Rhodesian copper miner. C.L.R. James. Habits once formed are difficult to get rid of. That is why we maintain that colonies are the breeding ground for the type of fascist mentality which is being let loose in Europe today. The fight against fascism cannot be separated from the right of all colonial peoples and subject races to self-determination. For any people who help to keep another people in slavery are at the same time forging their own chains. To conceive of getting rid of the capitalists without smashing up the empire is like trying to make the omelette without smashing the egg. George Padmore. The hour is struck for our complete emancipation. We will not tolerate the invasion of Abyssinia. The women are united with their men in this resolve. You said you brought us from Africa to Christianize us, but the only Christianity you gave us was 300 years of enslavement. You have talked about the white man's burden. Now we are carrying yours and standing between you and fascism. Hemi Ashburgavi. File 2, Colonial Remakes. 
With Ashbur Gavi, Padmore, and James' radical critiques of Empire still resounding in my ears, I open a new file and consider the films that Dickinson shot in Africa, which were made with either the support of or directly commissioned by the colonial office. Dickinson's directorial debut, The High Command, released in 1937, the same year of Record of War, was set and partly shot in the Gold Coast, today Ghana, then under British rule. Africa provides a mere exotic backdrop, a general atmosphere on which a battle of a British identity plays out. In Dickinson's second film, set in Africa, Men of Two Worlds, released in 1946, I'm struck by a particular scene. A makeshift screen is set up in a clearance in the forest. The tribe is gathered around it, their faces lit up in the blue glare of the projected images. A woman's voice, at once rigid, didactic and authoritarian, explains to the audience the, me the meaning of what they see. In The Path of Heroes, the fascist propaganda film The Dickinson had undercut just supposing it to a Soviet counter-propaganda documentary, we find an almost identical scene. The white screen is stretched, the crowd summoned. The projected images are surely different. In the latter, military parades swept across the streets of Rome, the fascist propaganda machine in full display. In Dickinson's screen within a screen, an educational film about sleeping sickness and the importance of evacuating the tsetse fly infested bush is shown. Yet both embody the same colonial attitude and media strategy, using the medium of film to instruct and inculcate. Commissioned by the British Colonial Office, Man of Two Worlds was conceived as a wartime propaganda project. Set in Tanganyika territory, the British share of former German East Africa, its aim was to depict the British colonial presence in Africa in a favorable light. The British appear as benevolent masters concerned with the modernization and civilization of their colonial subjects and territories. The plot centers around Kizenga, a composer and pianist who, after spending 15 years in London, decided to return to his village to have the English district commissioner to combat an outburst of sleeping sickness. A man of two words, Kizenga is opposed by the village witch doctor who turns the community, including Kizenga's family, against the former. A stranger in his own home, Kizenga suffers a nervous breakdown. In a 1945 article, Dickinson describes Man of Two Worlds as representing the conflict between allied progressivism and fascism. Yet this conflict was not for Dickinson between Europe and Africa, but between a reactionary Africa and a progressive one, which with the aid of the colonial British rule could change for its own good. Away in the bush, Dickinson writes, there still survive amongst the slow development of tribal society, the false racial pride, terrorism, and opposition to innovation, which we in Europe recognize in Nazism. The distance from Pamor's idea of colonial fascism could not be overstated. Rather than addressing the fascistic tendencies inherent in European colonialism, including British colonialism, Dickinson directs his indictment towards the traditional African culture and society depicted as backward, reactionary, unreasonable, unreasonable and refractory to the changes and innovations introduced by the putatively benign British colonial presence. The Western African Students' Union, who had agreed to help with the film's production, was not blind to its flaws and limitations. As their protracted negotiations with the colonial office show, they protested against various aspects of the script, claiming that the story misrepresented African customs and demeaned African figures. The little tribe is portrayed as torpid and infantile, lazy and superstitious, held in sway by a host of foreign authority figures. But the Western African Students' Union objected in particular to the characterization of the figure of a witch doctor, Magole, as a scheming outsider aiming only for power. The demonization of which doctors as representatives of indigenous knowledge and tradition often goes in end in end, as it does in the film, with programs of forced resettlements of local populations 
and land expropriation. As Silvia Federici details in her study of the witch in a colonial context, witch hunting was a deliberate strategy used by the authorities to instill terror, destroy collective resistance, silence entire communities, and turn their members against each other. It was also a strategy of enclosure, which depending on the context could be enclosure of land, bodies, and social relations. In the manner towards the transfer of a population to a new settlement on higher ground is justified by the need to set fire to the bush and thus destroy that sets of fly which is causing the sleeping sickness. Yet such a humanitarian aim hides other, less altruistic reasons. These other motivations sometimes slip out into the open, as when District Commissioner Randall reveals that the resettlement will increase the population density and make it easier to marshal and control. Dickinson illustrates the resettlement by showing a population that is actively mobilized, not forcibly deported. Set to an encouraging soundtrack, montage, montage sequences show them as they build a road, erect a bridge, clear the land, construct houses. In this vision, a paternalistic colonial rule appears to benignly facilitate the cultivation of both land and people. According to Randall, the land is worn out and the little lack initiative. Part of his task is to get them working. Yet as an African reviewer of the film, James N. Hewa has suggested, the little's reluctance to move can also be read as a form of resistance in itself, a reaction informed by their previous experiences of colonialism and forced labor. The utopian ending of the film, showing natives in tracks happily crossing the bridge towards new lands, obscures and falsifies the real conditions under which such population resettlements often took place. It is here that the limitations of Dickinson, Man of Two Worlds, come into full sight. The film mixture of liberal openness and colonial hubris is ultimately predicated on the imperial faith that meaningful change could only come from European civilization, as well as a paternalistic understanding of freedom and self-rule as something that could only be granted from outside and whose endowment was forever delayed under the pretext of gradualist caution. As an officer of a colonial office noted, men of towards shows British administration um, through appropriately rosy spectacles. The voices of James, Padmore, Ashwood Gavi and other anti-colonial intellectuals can help us shatter these rosy spectacles. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elisa. So we're now going to move into conversation again with all our researchers, moderated by Sarah Maherta, who is manager of UAL's Archives and Special Collections Centre. Again, uh, if you have any questions, please post these to the chat. Thanks. Thank you, Elisa, um, for that incredibly um, rich and um, provocative um, paper. Um, you know, making, um, explaining how you've used the Thorold Dickinson archive and how you've looked at these very challenging issues um, through your paper. I'm just posting into the chat the, um, the link to the Thorold Dickinson archive, um, which you showed on the screen a little earlier, uh, for anybody who wants to follow it up. Um, and to, um, uh, maybe we can start by um, having a, a discussion around um, the, the process of the research and I mean as you as you pointed out um, archives are always partial and lacking um, mm -hmm. they're always biased they're, they're never complete records um, and that really brings us face to face with the silences of an archive um, as well as what they actually show um, and that poses challenges, especially to the kind of speculative research that, that you are undertaking. Um, and I wondered if it might be interesting to, uh, for you to sort of say a little bit more about those um, challenges of the process of the speculative research. Yeah, Th thanks a lot for the question, Sarah. Uh, so yeah, um, I think, yeah, I started from a particular kind of hypothesis when I, when I started my research, uh, which uh, was really like trying to find uh, more information about like this screening that happened in 1937 
Um, and that was actually like my only uh, knowledge of Thoral Dickinson because I, I didn't, you know, I wasn't an expert of Thoral Dickinson. So I started uh, from that screening because I uh, I saw it when it was uh, actually uh, restaged uh, in in 2017, and I, I thought it was a you know a really powerful kind of um, screening that uh, used this uh, dovetailing and this just opposition uh, in in order to actually you know criticize <clears throat> what at the time was like the like the fascist invasion of uh, um, of Ethiopia, and I also you know kind of mistakenly maybe thought that the uh, was much a much more kind of you know anti-colonial uh, uh, person than it actually turns out to be so when I when I started to do research in the archive I was actually confronted with with, uh, with things that weren't what I was expecting and I was trying to find kind of traces of this kind of micro event and also to you know recon like see it in in the context in which happens and a context that in the archive because you have this uh, way of uh, uh, you know cataloging things uh, according to what in particular kind of you know individual in this case so it's the Thoral Dickinson collection so you always have a particular way of looking at this that completely erases things that were happening at the same time and then maybe could have you know there could have been like potential encounters there so in a way I did like this kind of speculative sort of exercise of trying to see if both connections took place. Uh, and then at some point in my research, I realized that there was a kind of absurdity in trying to, you know, to find this, this kind of encounters. And that it made much more sense instead to think about how, like, you know, bringing together these stories that the archive kept separate could help us to undo and to kind of read in a different ways the things that were, that are in the Dickinson archive. So, you know, in, in a way of trying to bring that dovetailing by using, uh, like by, by actually, you know, listening to, to those voices and to those other critics of empire and bring them in, in the Thoreau Dickinson archive to look at his own actually representation of empire. So for me, that was a kind of, you know, way of enriching what, what was in the archive, but also kind of, you know, contesting some of the things that are there that we don't tend to look through this, this other perspective, uh, which was much needed, I thought. I don't know if that the answers to to the question. Of course, yes. Thank you. Yes. So, do you think that your did your project um, change? You know, did did this sort of you've talked about how you started with one premise and then you you realised you had to move a little bit and start to bring things together and and this this sort of process of changing and dovetailing mm. um, seems to um, seems to be sort of demonstrated through the paper of your research. Yeah. Yeah. I. I yeah, I think it was like, you know, kind of necessary like to, to change things when I started to to see different things in the archive and the project became more like a deconstructive sort of project uh, than it was at the beginning. Uh, and so uh, the, the kind of second uh, section, uh, which is uh, there now, uh, and then the, there will be a third kind of file in that. But these other sections look at the archive that is there and try uh, to actually undo it uh, in, you know, in, in what is um, in what is in the archive, really. So, yeah, the, the, there was definitely a change throughout the process and kind of using that, uh, you know, that dovetailing sort of method was for me to just suppose different pieces of information that come not just from the archive, but from other places as well. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, I can see there's a hand up in the audience of um, Pratap Raghani. Would you like to come in, Pratap? Are you there? Maybe you're muted. Okay, we'll carry on. Pratap can come in when he's available again. Um, so yes, I mean you've you've mentioned um, the the dovetailing, and I mean I I kind of we we often talk about serendipity, serendipitous uh, searching and finding of things, um, you know, sort of through research practices, through um, going into archives and libraries. Of course, uh, you know this, this year you've had the added challenge of not really being able to engage with the archive physically terribly well or, or very often. So that was very much forefronted in, in your research. Um, but also it seems to me as though your research practice was far more deliberate. Um, and you, you know, you, you were um, sort of finding these links and, and as you've said, bringing together um, in your 
um, articulation of your work, um, you know, the events that are scarcely noted in the archives, but are separated through the through the practice of, of curating the archive, as it were. So um, that process of dovetailing seems to me particularly interesting. I wondered if there's uh, if you wanted to expand on that. I can see a couple more hands up too, so we'll, we'll have a look at that. Uh, yeah, sh shall, I, shall I go ahead or shall I? Yes, Elisa, uh, and then put up. Uh, okay, yeah, so uh, yeah, this, this kind of uh, idea, uh, idea of dovetailing was a really bringing thing that generally are kept separate. And I was kind of uh, thinking around this idea of like the segregation of knowledge that I actually take from um, a paper written by uh, West and William Martin is actually the introduction of the book that is called From Toussaint to Tupac that looks at the kind of uh, at the segregation of certain particular uh, histories, especially of like black history that come, come from different contexts, so from the US and, and uh, the uh, and, and other contexts that are kept in, in a separation. And so it's not possible to see this kind of unified, um, you know, series of, of, uh, of struggles there. And so this, this idea of thinking what we can do instead to kind of disrupt that, that sort of separation through the method of dovetailing was something that was very much at the centre of what I was trying to do. Thank you. Um, Pratap? Hi there. Yes, I'm sorry my uh, audio was muted thank you for unmuting it and i've been trying to put the question in the chat which is also muted but so i'll i'll read it but uh, thank you so much for the presentations um and fan really fantastic event um elisa i had a, a a question for you um i'm just going to read it from what i put in the chat a uh, great paper and imagery does dickinson offer a written assessment or critique of pan-africanism mm. and also the ethnocentrism of Pan-Africanism, which has been a subject of, of debate within different liberation movements. And I wondered if you'd found that, whether you think that later influenced his approach to the UN and UNESCO and his work mm. there. Mm. Yeah, I I think he had a, you know, a very uh, sort of, um, you know, na I, I call it naive, I don't know if it's like the, the right term, but he had like a sense of, you know, it, it was a kind of, very liberal uh, sort of uh, person that the thought that the you know you needed to have this kind of uh, international kind of alliances uh, which were uh, important for him uh, and uh, you mentioned there uh, which is another important point of of his practice that he was active at the UN was actually the director of the uh, film unit uh, at the UN from uh, 1956 to 1960 to 1960 for four years and it's actually a very interesting moment because it's also the moment in which you have like the decolonization and the kind of yeah. you know independence of of many countries in that period but enter within that organization and that's something that i come come to i'm trying to map you know i'm trying to map these two stories onto each other in the third kind of file that i will uh, i will be writing about and i think he had still this uh, you know, this very, um, I, could, I don't know, idealistic idea of what that international cooperation could do. And in this idealistic idea, it wasn't, it wasn't seeing actually what were uh, the hierarchical orders that were present in an organization like the United Nations and that were carried over from what was the League of Nations before. So I thought it was really interesting also to focus on this particular moment, which is the uh, invasion of, uh, of Ethiopia, because that invasion of Ethiopia showed uh, how there was a hierarchical order in the League of Nations. Uh, and, and, and I think these things will be carried over after. So I don't know if this as, uh, answers to your question, because actually you were talking, like you were asking about like the, like the Pan-African movement uh, more specifically. So I'm not exactly sure about his, uh, um, you know, his uh, judgment on that, because I, I think it wasn't, you know, it wasn't very, uh, I, I'm trying to bring this link with the Pan-African movement, but I'm not sure it was something that was in his mind. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's an interesting speculation, and thank you for mm. taking us to that place. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Pratap. Um, maybe this is the moment to um, ask the other presenters, the, the other researchers and residents, if they have any any comments or questions um, for Elisa. Oka? Thank you.
You can't. I can't oh, hear you. But you don't you. seem to. Uh, you you don't now? seem to be muted. Yes. Yes. Can you hear me now? Okay. Apologies. Um, thank you so much, Elisa. I learned so much, and it's also been great to see the evolution of your research project. You know, like from the beginning of what what you thought it was going to be, and and to now. You know, I think it's it's, it's really great. Um, and I wanted to ask something that actually kind of builds on Pratap's question, which is. Um, I noticed that, you know, Thoral Dickinson also went to India, for instance, mm -hmm. um, and those are also in the archives. And so I was wondering if you noticed the same sort of uh, colonial racism and paternalism in other areas and, and sort of um, uh, whether there was, I was going to ask a question about, you know, making linkages between Afro-Asian solidarities yeah. with regards to Thoral Dickinson, but maybe you already answered a bit of that in Pratap's question, but I, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, I, that, that's a great question because that's another like bit that should enter at some point in, in that paper, uh, and especially in the kind of colonial uh, remakes uh, section that I was, uh, you know, I was uh, looking especially at Men of Two Worlds, but in the same period he actually visits uh, India, as, as you noted there, in 1946, and he was actually the uh, when uh, there is like a uh, like the revolt in in, uh, uh, in 1946, uh, so it, it, it was there at the moment, and it writes like a report and also letters about these events, and you can see like the same sort of you know mentality that plays out there on like this sort of idea of uh, um, you know a, again a paternalistic vision of colonialism and what kind of progresses could be done in the country with like the introduction of like constructions of the dam in, in a particular place, you, you know, all these kind of um, kind of issues come back in, in that particular specific place uh, in this time in India as well. And he uses the expression men of the world. Uh, he had just finished the film to talk about uh, certain uh, like Indian people that according to him were in between two worlds. So there is again like this kind of, you know, this kind of, you know, projecting a particular kind of uh, of image uh, on on other places in the world. So yeah, I think it's it's really important what you say there of like the counterpoint to that and what that kind of African Asian, uh, you know, um, connection uh, against those particular um, yeah those those particular uh, forms of uh, British colonial presence. Uh, you know, is, is something that I should actually uh, link up more. But thank you for the question. Thank you. Anna, would you like to come in? Um, yes, thank you so much. Uh, I agree also with Oka. It's been so amazing to see the process of the research. And I think my question might be outside of the scope of this project, but I wondered if you have thought about that restaging that you attended in 2017. Mm -hmm. And have thought of you know any any details or any other traces that you know, might want to connect to the first screening. You know, mm -hmm. I mean it's um, <laughs> they are far from each other, but you know, in this idea of uh, unsettling history, maybe. <laughs> mm, can you can you uh, like repeat the? Because I. Can uh, so, yeah, so if you have thought of any details of that restaging in 2017, mm. you know, I don't know exactly the context of yes. that, but, you know, is there anything that could resonate with the initial screening? Yeah, yeah, that's that's really interesting because uh, uh, actually the, the screening was uh, remade three times. So the first time it was in 1937, then it was uh, restaged by uh, Dickinson himself in uh, 1969. And at the time it was like a, um, uh, a, f a professor of film at, at the Slade. Uh, and so it was redone in that occasion within a series of lectures that had to do uh, with the history of the of the 20th century and that were organized by uh, AGP uh, Taylor. Uh, and, and then again, in 2017, you have this restaging uh, that was staged by uh, Henry K. Miller in collaboration with Bridget Law at the UCL. And I think in, in you know, in that restaging, um, th there was, uh, first of all, a kind of virtual uh, like way of actually change the reels in real time while doing uh, the, the, the projection. So it was a kind of very difficult technical exercise uh, to do. 
Uh, and it was, uh, um, you know, they were trying to uh, think about ideas of fake news and so the kind of, you know, post-truth uh, sort of scenario we find ourselves in because there was like this example of a film that was using the technique of dovetailing and montage to actually deconstruct like a particular kind of propaganda uh, that was put out by uh, by the fascist regime in Italy. Then, of course, you have, you know, it, I think you have a lot of things there because then you have a counter-propaganda film from, from a Soviet perspective. But, you know, th there is something that I was uh, really aware during the, the process of a lacking of actual local voices. And also when I talk about the, you know, the Pan-African movement, is also, it's also kind of, you know, a projection that come from outside from, from a, a, a big extent. So there are a lot of things there that, you know, need to be kind of investigated for further. Um, but yeah, and and they tried also to make like this connection with uh, like a sort of post-colonial reading of that particular film, uh, and they had Neelam Srivastava as a person that was talking uh, um, and, uh, as a, as a scholar in uh, especially in uh, like Italian colonialism, uh, which was talking about the, um, about this after after the screening. So there there was like you know the screening was already doing uh, a lot of things that have actually made me uh, think, and then I've you know, I've tried to kind of uh, bring in this this connection to actually, you know, think about uh, this screen in a kind of larger context. Yes, Mohammed. Mohammed. Oh, you are muted. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elisa. Um, same as uh, Orca and Anna, I have to say, it's great to your uh, uh, development of the uh, project and thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, my question is basically kind of elaboration on the previous questions um, and it's uh, I'm quite interested to know within the context of your paper uh, that you're writing now and uh, the, the overall uh, research are you uh, you touched on the idea of post truth and the whole sort of uh, you know, uh, the problem and confrontation that, uh, the challenges that we confront in, 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 in our time. Uh, have you thought uh, to sort of create a kind of connection between uh, the uh, archival material that you looked at uh, in order to interpret those things within the context of right now and try to sort of uh, you know, uh, pick a few examples to see how uh, those um, uh, material that you looked at could be uh, representative within the context of contemporary examples in our, mm. you know. Yeah, that's um, that's a very, yeah, that's a very good question. Thanks, thanks, Mohammed, for that. Because yeah, I think I think there is like a you know a risk for the kind of historical scope of my research focusing on the 1930s to kind of uh, like seem as if it was like a kind of uh, historicist or antiquarian even kind of sort of research. And like the you know thinking about the present was very much in my mind, and it, it was something that I was thinking especially thinking about the kind of myths and mythologies that we have in the post-Second World War period on a kind of rewriting of a particular history of empire up to then. Uh, and it's it's something where you have, especially in the kind of public discourse, this sort of dichotomy uh, that is then, uh, you know, uh, perpetrated between a kind of, uh, you know, halide uh, sort of progressivism, uh, which, uh, of course, they had their colonial empire, but they were better than, uh, you know, the kind Kind of uh, uh, fascist uh, imperialism, and I think that there is, uh, you know, a, a kind of danger in in this particular position. And I think it's important to look instead of those kind of, uh, you know, critiques of empire which were much more radical, and they were looking at, uh, you know, the kind of uh, fascist and like the, the, the fascist uh, characters that were present in in any form of colonialism. Uh, and and this is something that you find, of course, in the Anglophone sphere with uh, Ciela James or George Padmore or Amy Ashwood Gavi, but you find also in the Francophone sphere with Amy Cesar and this discourse on colonialism. Uh, so this was like a position that was, you know, very much held at the moment, but then it seems to be completely kind of submerged or distorted.
slaughtering the kind of meats that are told in, in the Second World War period. And I think this kind of uh, things are still present in the conversation that we have around empire in, in the UK in, in this present moment, and especially around the kind of um, you know, the kind of meets also around the figure of Churchill, for instance, or, you know, the, the, the kind of things that it, it represents within mm. within that. Uh, yeah. And so I'm, I'm thinking back at the, you know, Black Lives uh, Matter protest in, in, in uh, uh, the summer and when there was like this kind of brigade of people defending the Churchill uh, uh, monument and doing like the Nazi salute uh, under that, you know, uh, which according to particular sort of narratives should be like a paradoxical thing. But actually, if you look in Instead, at, at the actual uh, history and also the fact that Churchill was a sympathizer of, of Mussolini, and it's like you know you you uh, um, you, you unravel uh, mm. and you uh, unearth a different kind of uh, story there. Um, so I, you know, th that was something that was in my mind. I don't know if my you know if my project is you know is just trying to kind of look yeah. at things. And I think that uh, Priyambada uh, Gopal, who I, who I quote, she's she's really good. Uh, you, with with this kind of things and what she calls like the myths uh, of the you know post Second World War period. So mm -hmm. yeah, I hope that answers to your question. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you, Elisa. I think we may have time to just quickly address the um, question that's in the chat. Although I'm sure Susan wants to draw us to the lunch break, um, but just to reference that um, uh, Ilaria has kindly put in the chat um, to Elisa. Um, thank you so much for your amazing paper, Elisa. Coming from a museum background, I'm thinking about how such archives, e.g. the Dickinson one, can um, be displayed, shown to a wider public, thinking how mu certain museum pieces or collections could be put in dialogue or given context with certain archives. So I don't know if there's anything more you want to briefly touch on with that. I feel you have covered that slightly in, in some of your earlier conversations. Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. And, you know, it's it's not something I've I've been doing actively through kind of, you know, I've, I've tried to do it like by bringing these documents together in my paper. But I think that there is a lot of work that, that can be done, actually, to construct like different narratives. Uh, so, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. Ilaria. Thank you for the question, Ilaria. And thank you, uh, Elisa. And um, thank you so much for your amazing paper. Thank you for the contributions of the um, the presenters here um, in the questions and answers and I'll hand over to Susan. Thank you Sarah. So yes we're going to stop here to break for lunch um, and let me echo the thanks to Oka and Elisa for your incredible presentations and to Anna, Mohamed, Gustavo and Sarah for the conversations and reflections so far. So um, we'll see everyone back here at 1.45 for part two of the Decolonizing Archives Symposium. And please remember to keep your mics and cameras off in the meantime. Thank you.